Stand by for touchdown. Stand by. July 20th, 1969. Bam! The Eagle touches down. Minutes later, astronaut Neil Armstrong becomes the first man to set foot on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Putting a man on the moon. A pretty amazing accomplishment. But have you ever thought about how one actually gets to the moon? I mean, just point your rocket at the moon and blast off, right? No. There's a little more to it than that. In fact, the one thing you can't do is point your rocket at the moon. Flying to the moon is a little like taking a vacation. First, you have to decide how big a vehicle you need. And of course, that depends on where you're going, how many people you're taking, and how much stuff you need to bring with you. No way, you're not taking that. Put it back. For their trip to the moon, NASA took three men. And their vehicle was the massive Saturn V rocket. Now, there's one major difference with traveling to the moon. There are no gas stations along the way where you can refuel. So right from the start, you have to carry all the fuel you're going to need to get you there and back. Now, a good vacation requires that you know exactly where you're going. But flying to the moon is not the easiest route to plan. There are a few complications. Imagine for a moment that Mike is the moon, I'm the Earth, and this football is a rocket. Now, if Mike's just standing still, I can easily get the rocket to him. But that's not how things are in the real world. Nothing is standing still. Everything is in motion. The moon is revolving around the Earth. The Earth is revolving around the sun. The Earth is also rotating on its axis, and so is the moon. And of course, you don't want to land on the moon in darkness, so you have to arrive when the sun is shining on your landing site, or when Mike is facing the ball. Lining up all these variables requires incredible timing. And that's why you can't just aim your rocket at the moon. Because it won't be there when you arrive. Since the moon is moving, you have to calculate where it will be when your spacecraft gets there. You have to intercept the moon, not chase after it. Okay, we got fuel. Check. Supplies. Check. Directions. Check. Everyone's been to the bathroom? Then let's go. You might be surprised to learn that flying to the moon requires two launches. You've seen the first one. It's the noisy one that gets the rocket off the ground. The purpose of the first launch is to power the rocket into orbit around the Earth. After a few revolutions to check that everything is still working, the astronauts prepare to leave orbit. This is where the second launch takes place. Three, two, one, ignition. We confirm ignition and the thrusters go. Now the spacecraft is finally on its way to the moon. Once the spacecraft breaks away from the Earth, something very surprising happens. We're trying to conserve fuel, right? So what's the best way to do that? How about turning off the engine? Well, that's exactly what the astronauts do. They turn their engine off, and they coast. They can do that because in space there's no air or friction to slow them down. And that's how they get to the moon. They just get going really fast and they coast. Now there's only one problem with coasting. We can't stop. If we stop, we'll lose all our momentum and we don't have enough fuel to get going again. 
So somehow we're going to have to land on the moon without stopping. How do we do that? You guys are going to have to jump out. While we're still moving? You got it. And that's exactly what happened when the astronauts reached the moon. The command module coasts into orbit, while the smaller lunar module makes the trip down to the surface. And once they land on the moon, it's time to see the sights. Hey! Yeah. But unfortunately, when you travel to the moon, there's always one last problem, getting home. My golly, this time goes fast. To return to the Earth, the astronauts on the surface have to link up with the orbiting command module. But they only have enough fuel for one attempt, so their timing has to be perfect. To make the spacecraft as light as possible, any excess equipment gets left behind, including the landing gear. Okay, 30 seconds. Coming up next, Mike scratches the surface to reveal why we itch. And we answer some viewer questions. It's with chopped walnuts and of Toronto emailed us and wants to know why people faint. Well, fainting is a sudden loss of consciousness due to an abrupt loss of blood to your brain. <sighs> Rapid breathing, like when you lift weights, causes an excess loss of carbon dioxide from your body. This causes the blood vessels in your brain to shrink. It's called hyperventilation. Lifting weights also causes blood to move from your head to your muscles. The combination of hyperventilation and the loss of blood from your head to your muscles can lead to unconsciousness. Mike, Mike, wake up, buddy. So what's the purpose of fainting? Well, when you faint, your body goes limp, you fall to the ground. Being horizontal allows gravity to restore the blood flow to your head, restoring consciousness. All right, coach, I'm ready. Put me in. Recognize this sound? John O'Donnell of Scarborough writes and asks, how does Velcro work? During a walk, Swiss inventor George Simmons Drown noticed that birds kept sticking to his clothing. While picking them off his pants and socks, he realized he might be able to use a fastener that works the same way. Thus, the invention of Velcro. So what's in Velcro that makes it stick together like the burrs that stick to your clothing? Well, when you look closely, you'll see that Velcro is actually made up of two sides. One side is made up of tiny hooks, and the other side is made up of tiny loops. When you press the two sides together, the hooks lock into the loops. Only you've got hundreds of hooks and loops on every Velcro strip. It's this interlocking that makes Velcro stick. And the force of your hand is enough to pry the hooks and loops apart, making Velcro easy to open and close.
no, no, wait, you don't understand. I had this itch that I just had to scratch. This ever happened to you? You get the most aggravating itch in the most sensitive spot at the most inopportune time? Well, you ever stop to wonder why we itch? I mean, aside from embarrassing us in public, does it serve any purpose? Well, as it turns out, it does. But before we get to that, we need to cover a bit of background. Like, what is an itch? Well, an itch is a sensation produced when certain nerves in the body are stimulated. You see, the surface of our body is covered with millions of nerve endings. These nerve endings take in sensory information about the world around us and carry it back to the brain. But what does that have to do with itching? Well, think of the nervous system as a large communications network inside your body. Now, at the surface of the skin, you've got those millions of nerve endings I was talking about before. These nerve endings register different sensations. For example, this one registers touch, and this one heat, and this one cold. But the receptor we're interested in is this one here. It's the pain receptor. Ow! What the? Sheesh! Now, if you were to take a closer look at the pain receptor, you'd notice it's actually made up of three different nerve fibers. Here's how they work. Forceful stimulation, like when a sharp point penetrates the skin, activates the first two nerve fibers, which in turn send a very strong pain message to the brain. Mild stimulation, on the other hand, like that caused by a minor pinprick, activates the third nerve fiber, which registers only mild irritation. Now, it's believed that impulses from this third nerve fiber and impulses from the... Ow! Jeez! ...touch receptor combine to produce the itch sensation. So an itch is a very subtle form of pain. But why itch? What purpose does it serve? Well, very much the same purpose that pain does. You see, as uncomfortable as it can be, pain is actually a vital warning that tells you something's wrong with your body. Like perhaps your hand is a little too close to a fire. Or you have a wound that needs attention before it becomes infected. Itching serves the same purpose. It warns the body that some kind of noxious substance or pest has intruded onto or into the skin. For example, ticks and lice will trigger nerve endings as they try to burrow into your skin. A fungus will cause an itch response as it begins to take root. A mosquito will leave behind some of its saliva after drawing blood. The saliva causes your body to release a substance called histamine. Histamine binds itself to nerve endings, causing itching and swelling. So itching is a type of early warning system, kind of like the silent alarm on a house. When an intruder tries to break in, it triggers the sense of wiring, which sets off the alarm. Code six, one five, there he is. I got him. I got him. I got him. I got him. You're not going anywhere. You're not going away. Coming your way. Coming your way. Coming your way. Of course, when we itch, we don't call the police. We scratch. Scratching actually serves two purposes. First, it dislodges any pests that may be trying to break through the skin. Second, it actually provides temporary relief from the itch. You see, forceful scratching will produce pain. The pain overrides the itch. But too much scratching will do more harm than good. You may break the skin and cause an infection. A particularly persistent itch may require more effective methods, like medication. The active ingredient in most itch medications is a local anesthetic. The anesthetic molecule plugs nerve endings, preventing the transmission of impulses, essentially blocking out the itch sensation. But the relief from medication is only temporary. I mean, 
and the anesthetic eventually wears off, we might as well get used to the fact that we're always going to have some itch we need to scratch. I just wish it wouldn't happen in public. There he is. That's the guy. Well, you don't understand, officer. You see, I had this itch that I just had to scratch. I mean, it was nothing else. You know, that mm -hmm. kind of itch. I just had to scratch it. And I, I don't know what happened. Things got blown out of proportion. Join us next week as Inquiring Minds explores more mind-boggling issues. Meanwhile, The Limit takes a close look at how the Millennium Tower was built.